Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics and this is my Nintendo VS sit-down game more commonly known as the Red Tent. I got this thing a while ago there's a few videos on how I brought it back to life and uh, I will put links into the description of those episodes which you may want to watch if you have any interest in this game but anyway, I sat for a while, played it, I had Super Mario in it, I had a bunch of other games in it that I cycled through. And then a few months ago, a few weeks before Christmas actually, I turned it on and I was just about to sit down to play a game and I got the electrical smell and all of a sudden a lot of magic smoke came out of it. Just like that. I didn't do anything. Promise. It just decided to go bad. So what I did was, of course, I shut it off immediately. And uh, when I opened it up, there was still smoke coming out of the monitor chassis of the monitor we're looking at. This is monitor B. This is the, the second side. You may remember this is basically symmetrical one or two players can play on each side and I think there's a baseball game where four people can play at the same time but anyway back to that uh, the way you open this thing up let's have a quick look and see if I can do this okay So you'll see they uh, literally shoehorn two monitors in here. They're slightly offset because uh, they're on the left edge on each side and they had to do that for the monitors to coexist peacefully in here. You can see the frame of the other monitor in the back. But basically the smoke was coming, you can barely see the PCB. And I mean, it was so bad, normally you get some magic smoke, you turn off power, and it stops. But I had turned off power, and about a minute or two had passed uh, before I opened it, and the board was still smoking. Now, a CRT monitor going up in smoke is a bad thing. When you want to keep your machine original, and in this case it was a triple bad thing, or double bad thing, whichever way you look at it, because these CRTs were not used in very many games. They were used in the red tent, two each obviously, and then Nintendo had some other sit-down games that used the same monitor. What's unique about it is, is that it's an 18-inch monitor. It has, and it has, it also has the uh, sound amplifier built in that the game utilizes. That's not a big deal actually. But the main part is that I try to avoid LCD replacements as much as I can. I like to keep them original. They're in good shape, but even from here you can see the burning in there. And that's because this game had been converted to, cyber, to Atari Cyberball, which is a two-monitor game. And... Uh, the reason there's no Cyberball in here was when I found this game, the stipulation was that I had to give the Cyberball PCBs back. And I was basically on my own. I had to find a harness, an original board, and all of that good stuff. But we went through it, and uh, it's really an 8-bit Nintendo, an NES, actually two of them, that talk to each other. So that, you know, when you have four-player games, the two sides or the two Nintendos can talk to each other. The burning you see is from Cyberball. It's almost equivalent. This this one's a little worse than the other side, but it's not that obvious when the game's running. So with all that said, you know, I was very hesitant in ripping into the uh, chassis on this one because it looked pretty bad. There was a lot of burnt stuff blown fuses, something had, I mean, 
it had a super catastrophe. And I still don't know how that happened, but obviously it did happen. And after a lot of soul searching, I decided I was too stupid to fix this, or it was too, too risky for me to fix it. Because if I made it worse, I was going to have a really hard time finding a replacement for this. So I found someone who repairs these and sent the chassis off to them. And a few weeks ago, the chassis came back. It did take <clears throat> about four and a half months to get it repaired, but and it wasn't that cheap. But it had to get. I wanted to get it fixed, so I would have this entire cab working. I very carefully reconnected the chassis, put the monitor back in, and uh, put a board in with two games and ran the games. And of course the colors were off completely. The uh, intensity that you set on the flyback and the focus were off. Because I think the person that fixed this didn't actually have a red tent but he has he has some other test equipment where I think he just bench fixes the when he he fixes the the boards and then uses test instruments to make sure that it's operating correctly. Did a great job on it. It was recapped, a lot of resistors, and a few transistors were uh, replaced. The horizontal output transistor was replaced. The flyback tested good, and it was kind of cool. I mean, maybe I'll show you a little later, but everything that was replaced was marked with a red uh, nail polish, which is really a good thing to do when you're recapping something, as not to lose track of what you've replaced. And all the other stuff, all the resistors, all pretty much all everything else, even marked the uh, the fuses that got replaced also got a red dot on them, which is a very organized way of doing it because uh, you always know what you've already looked at and what you haven't. There also were some blue dots on there, I think, or non-red dots, and I think what that may have meant is, uh, hey, uh, this component was tested, was specifically tested and it's good. I don't know. But I got, I got the thing back, and obviously it was totally misadjusted, and I started playing. There's like three different color adjustments for each color on the monitor, and they're hard to get to. But I went through it for a while, and it took me like an hour to turn every knob and try everything, and until I finally realized what was wrong. There was no blue color. Nothing blue on the screen. Red and green worked perfectly, but blue was totally absent. So what do I do? Well, any sane person would have packed it up in the box that was still sitting there and sent it right back to the repair guy and said, Hey buddy, we, got, we still got a little bit of a problem here. Can you take care of it? But uh, considering how long it took to get it back, which I'm, I'm not complaining about it. it, it was made clear to me that it would take a long time. Nonetheless, it's still, I didn't want to wait another long time to get blue restored on it. So I decided to dig in. This is not going to be a live repair because uh, this went on over several evenings whenever I had time. And we'll have a look at the schematics and I'll talk you through what I did and some of the blind alleys I went out, went into to figure out why blue was missing. Here's the entire schematic. The big area here is the chassis. This part is the neck board. And here's the actual CRT. Obviously not drawn to scale, but uh, yeah, everything happens on the chassis and then the results of it are pumped to the CRT and then you get your color. So uh, the first thing I did was to identify what happened to the blue signal. Look at the path of the blue signal, 
How does it travel? How does it get modified? And then how does it get injected into the CRT? Another thing I, f I forgot to say before was, yeah, a lot of parts were replaced. On top of all the parts I mentioned, there are two ICs on this board, a voltage regulator and the raster generator here, and both of these were also replaced. So again, a lot of stuff was replaced on it, and a comment I got from the guy repairing it, he gave me some explanations of what was going on, and his, the closing sentence said, thanks for the challenge. So uh, that just made me feel a lot better having sent this board off to someone who knew a lot better than me on uh, how to fix these things. I started working on this problem backwards, and the reason for that was, my assumption was that the board was 100% fixed. So if the board's 100% fixed, either what's coming in on this side's bad, the video signal, but I tested this. Remember, there's a second monitor in the red tent, and I just and that monitor sitting on the A side, and I just took the video connector for the A side. Actually, no, I took the B side connector and plugged it into the A monitor, and the picture was perfectly, perfectly good. The blue was in there, everything was, everything worked. So I eliminated this part. The incoming signal was good. What that left us with, I mean, the neck board was, of course, sent in with the chassis, that left the CRT. And that was a bad moment because what that could mean is that if the board really works, then uh, the blue gun in the CRT may be bad. By the way, note that the CRT is drawn to scale relative, you know, to the rest. But, you know, that, that will put me at, you know, square zero again because I'd have to go out and find a find a tube for this. Because, yeah, the, 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 there's people that'll tell you, yeah, why don't you just get yourself a tube rejuvenator and that'll bring back the blue and... Mm, I don't know, this this blue, I mean, I've seen weak tubes. There was no, there was no blue in here. None whatsoever. So I needed a way, I needed a quick way to test if the blue gun worked. And those of you that work with TVs probably are screaming the answer at me already, but I didn't know an easy way to do that. So uh, so I kind of looked at the schematics here, and this again, this is a neck board. We've got a transistor that's basically used as a driver slash level converter because it outputs 154 volts, which is what the maximum, I guess, what the tube needs. And it also has adjustments here. Remember I said there were a whole bunch of color adjustments. This has got like a blue drive and a blue bias adjustment. It's got another set of controls where you can adjust it, the blue intensity. So there were, I mean, the reason I spent so much time hunting the blue at first was if any of those controls are really badly set, you won't see any blue. If one of them is off completely, you won't. So, but I tried all different ranges and Proved to myself that there wasn't any blue. So, uh, you know, the blue comes out, it's negative sync, but the point to understand is that it's kind of, the signal is inverted, in that if you put 154 volts into the blue gun, it won't do anything. The closer you get to a ground, will increase the intensity of blue, till Obviously, when you get to ground itself, it's going to be at full intensity. So my thought was, hey, <clears throat> what if we could just inject ground into this signal here? Because theoretically, if we put a ground on this, the whole screen should light up in blue. And that would prove it. So I didn't want to remove parts in this and that, so I just decided to momentarily ground the collector on the driver transistor. 
not a good thing to directly ground it, but uh, the key word being momentarily. And after I reinvented the wheel, I did some reading on it, and I actually found references on the internet that said you could do that. So anyway, I uh, sat in a position where I could see the neck board, put a mirror in front of the monitor, and then briefly grounded this point over here. And guess what? The screen turned blue. First, I breathed a sigh of relief because the, the, the tube was obviously good, but that's when it dawned on me that the board had a defect. It wasn't passing the blue signal. So at first I did the exact wrong thing. Because there had been so much damage on the board and uh, things were fixed, I figured, hey, something got overlooked, maybe I can do, you know, a visual inspection. Maybe I'll find something that's burnt. And uh, the blue basically comes in over here, utilizes this section, this section, and then, of course, this section on the uh, neck board. So I looked. I didn't find anything, nothing untoward looking. All of the burned uh, components were gone. So then I went through and started measuring transistors. I actually took all of the transistors in this path out, five of them, and measured them on the uh, $5 tester. They all tested good. I measured resistances, but uh, I didn't take the resistors out. Keep in mind, when you measure a resistor and circuit, it will show slightly off values because there may be another resistor in parallel with it that you, not maybe, but is that you won't see immediately, but electrically is in there and will falsify the readings. But another approach that you can usually use is comparative testing. So even if a resistor shows a really bad value. These are, for instance, these sections are identical. So if I was measuring this resistor and it was off, all I'd do is measure this resistor or this resistor. These are all 470 ohm resistors. And even though the reading was off on an absolute level, if relatively these three showed the same readings, I took that as a good. And it's, it's not an unreasonable uh, assumption to make, generally. Anything else, caps, uh, the electrolytics were all replaced. Anything electrolytic had been replaced already. I measured these diodes. They both measured kind of funny, but again, I did comparative measurements, and uh, they all of the diodes in here read kind of funny. The forward voltage was good, but the inverse voltage drop was... well, it was there, and again, because of the nature of having parallel components, you'll get an inverse voltage drop on it, but hey, that, that, that was just the way it was supposed to be, because the others had that, and they red and green were working just fine. But I hadn't done anything, I hadn't fixed anything, and obviously the problem didn't just magically go away. So at this point I was kind of stumped. Visual inspection didn't help. Blindly removing components and just kind of randomly checking every... well, it wasn't even random, I did check everything, but it was just a... Uh, the wrong approach. Didn't work, didn't get me anywhere. So finally I said, all right, let's uh, do what I should have done from the very beginning, and that is to actually trace the signal with a scope. Scope's going to, if anybody's going to tell me what's going wrong here, it's going to be the scope. Now first off, let me caution you, because there are two rules, strict rules, that you have to follow. If you put a scope, if you utilize a scope to measure a uh, CRT chassis, so the first rule is the chassis has to be isolated from the AC outlet, i.e. it needs an isolation transformer. 
In my case, that was already there because these monitors actually take a Japanese AC voltage, which is 100 volts. So there's a step up down transformer in the game where you can select your input voltage, which is you, know, you can select your input voltage as 100, 120, 220, or 240, and it'll always supply 100 volts on the secondary, which is great. But that is also, it, of course, it doubles as an isolation transformer. Usually isolation transformers are one-to-one, -one, but in this case it's doing double duty in not just isolating, but uh, adjusting the incoming voltage. So the, uh, the device under test, or unit under test, which is the chassis, has to be isolated from the AC supply. Conversely, the test instrument you're using, a scope or whatever, should not be isolated, i.e. that goes straight into the wall. That has uh, earth ground available to it. If you follow that, you are mostly safe. If you plug a monitor chassis without an isolation transformer into the wall, then use an oscilloscope, plug it into the wall, and start probing. You're going to see smoke fly. A lot of, lot of magical smoke come. Mo it'll probably come out of the uh, oscilloscope. So keep that in mind, that the unit under test has to be isolated. So that's number one. Number two is, may not seem that obvious, but if you're going to put a scope on here, be aware of what the voltages are that you're measuring. I mean, if you're going to measure in the neck board, there's 150 some volts on here. Make sure that, this, that, that the scope can do that, that, you know, the uh, probe, with probe scaling and all of that. Read the manual. Make sure how high you can push that scope before it blows up. And then actually number three really is if you go to the flyback transformer, uh, the flyback transformer has some very high voltages on it. You can't measure them with a scope. I mean, not at least not with a scope that normal mortals can acquire. I'm sure there's scopes out there that can go up to 50 kilovolts or whatever. But don't even attempt it. Don't stick your probe in there. Like this whole area here is a do not probe area. So if you follow those three rules, you should be safe to probe a, a live CRT chassis. But the point is, you need to understand the schematics and know exactly what it is you're measuring before doing that. So after making sure that everything was hooked up correctly, I mean you ground the scope to any metal part on the monitor or on the chassis or the frame of the chassis, and that's your that's a good ground for you right there. I was going to probe this area here first where the blue signal comes in. It looks pretty safe. It's got 12, it's basically level converting. The input signal is zero to five is zero to five volts, and it was level converting it to twelve volts, which of course gets amplified further down the line. But so this looked, as I said before, this looked safe to probe. You got to make sure you're probing the right uh, components, of course. But theoretically, sticking the probe into anything, the scope probe into any place in here, should be safe. So even though I tested the input signal before by plugging this connector into a working monitor, I decided to test it again. I unplugged this and I tested, basically probed uh, the blue signal against ground. And uh, I got a beautiful 5 volt uh, blue signal coming in. Kind of looks comb-like. I don't have an example picture here, but there was, there was definitely a live, picture, uh, live signal coming in. Then I plugged in, the I plugged the connector back in, 
and measured blue again, and blue was gone. It was uh, basically sitting high and not moving a bit. So something on over here was uh, pinning the signal high, and it's not back here or back, you know, into the other into the advanced other uh, amplification stages. That must be happening right here. And uh, we just happen to have two diodes here. Hmm, interesting. This one's a simple blocking diode, and the only way current can flow from here to here is if this potential is lower than that potential. There's a 12 volt supply on here. It's sitting on a 12 volt rail, so uh, there should never be current flowing directly through this. Well, that 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 would explain why, if this this part failed, that would explain why this is always stuck high over here and there's no signal coming. So this time, let's not do comparative testing or visual testing. Let's get the part out. and test it with no external influences. Okay, let's see what the $5 tester says. Red is uh, terminal 1 connected to the cathode, and green is uh, terminal 2 on a tester connected to the anode. So what will this tell us? And it tells us But it sees a diode, the cathode on one, anode on two, correct, but it does tell us that the uh, forward voltage is somewhat high. I mean, it should be between 400 and 600. The capacitance is zero. When was the last time you saw an ideal component? Eh, I haven't seen one. So, uh, obviously the tester is it's hinting at something, but it's not exactly telling us what's going on here. So, we need to revert to another test instrument. So we're going to get a little more sophisticated. Instead of the $5 component tester, we're going to use this $2 multimeter in diode setting. And, uh, okay, let's just measure the forward drop. Hmm, the forward drop on this one is correct. 516. Remember it was like 680 on the tester. So what does it show us if we measure the inverse drop or the revert? So, uh, as you well know, this is supposed to be zero, no voltage. And it's basically showing us the same voltage drop that the uh, tester showed us. Except the tester was telling us that it's connected. It identified the cathode and anode correctly, but it got another forward, what it thought was a forward voltage, and showed that to us. So there's a bug in that tester. Obviously, this diode's bad. It's completely leaky. It's, it, it, it's not blocking the voltage, which it should do, of course. So what this is acting like, it's basically acting like a resistor. Like a weird resistor that I bet you that the, for, the, the inverse voltage will probably change based on current flowing, but what that means, if we look at this back closely again, this is whom we're measuring. And the purpose for this is, so exactly what's happening here, for exactly what is happening, not to happen, that the 12 volt, that the 12 volts doesn't go in here and pull the signal up all the time. 
Well, this is what's called, where did it go? This is what's called a really leaky diode. It's leaking in the wrong direction, acting like a resistor almost. I mean, putting it simply, but it's letting the volt, it's letting the current flow in the wrong direction and disable the actual incoming blue signal. For Grins, I took out the other diode, this one, that uh, the one that's connected to ground. And the way to distinguish is, yeah, the one we measured before, this one has the bent, uh, has the bent leads, and this one, the straight leaded one, is the one I took out of here. And now, if we measure this one, again, we measure forward. There. So measuring forward, the forward voltage on this, it's 550, it's fine, between 400 and 600. And now if we measure the inverse, it properly shows zero. It's blocking. It's blocking any current flowing from the anode. Any any current flowing from the cathode to the anode, which is the way it should be. So this one's actually good, but for good measure, I went in and I replaced both of them. Okay, now for the final test. And what do we see? Lots of blue. So how about that? It is fixed. So I guess the repair guy fixed it 96.8% or whatever number you want to put on it. And I fixed the rest, but uh, looks like it's running. The colors look good on it. And I'll probably let it run for a few hours to verify that nothing else blows up, but uh, success on this one. Now there is a little bit more to this because uh, <clears throat> the original PCB, the game board inside it, did not work correctly. So whenever this thing self-destructed, it uh, took the game board with it. So this is the end of this part. Next time we're going to have a look at the original game board and see if we can breathe some life into that again. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, share and comment. And we'll see you soon on the next one.